Yeah, I want to start uh, thanking the organizers and in particular uh, Klaus Morawitz because he coordinated, uh, you know, all my correspondence. And also I want to thank uh, Alvaro Ferraz, who was kind enough to swap the talk because it's one hour earlier here in Boston. So uh, giving the talk at 6.30 6 a.m. was a bit uh, too much. And uh, yeah, so I apologize for not being able to, to be there. Uh, the uh, term has started, so I have to teach. And I, I just couldn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort it out. But okay, so the talk is about uh, strongly coupled quantum systems, and in particular, I'm going to focus on dynamics, non-equilibrium processes, and uh, how to control them. Yeah. So the the contents of the talk are a first part, which connects with other talks this morning, later by Nick Prokakis, is about dynamics of phase transitions, and in particular, paying attention to universality as described by the kibel surek mechanism. And what we will do is to test this theory, this which is pretty well studied, at a strong coupling. So this is the first test at a strong coupling of the kibel surek mechanism, and we will use uh, tools of holography. So this first part of the talk is a bit uh, uh, more abstract, if you want. The second part of the talk is very applied, is about how to control the dynamics of strongly coupled quantum systems in the laboratory with ultra cold gases, and in particular, unitary Fermi gas, and how to use that, uh, how to use this uh, uh, trap unitary Fermi gas to do a quantum heat engine that uh, works uh, marvelously with no friction and a high efficiency. So let me start with the first part. And the first part is about uh, symmetry breaking, so a dynamics of a phase transition. So he has to recall a bit the key ingredients. You know, we have a, a spontaneous symmetry breaking scenario where we have some matter, say a bunch of spins, uh, with a high temperature are in a high symmetry phase. You know, there's some control parameter, which in this case is going to be the temperature. And at, above some critical value, there is a phase which is, as well, you well know, uh, you well know, is the paramagnetic phase. Yes, and then you can change this control parameter and there's uh, uh, below this critical value, there's a different kind of phase where the important thing is that there is different ground states all with the same energy. Yeah? So this is a standard spontaneous symmetry breaking scenario. Now, what we want to do is to describe the dynamics when we change the control parameter across its critical value. So we go from the high symmetry phase to the broken symmetry phase. And then you post the system into kind of a conflict because it has to decide which ground state is going to choose. And of course, what happens in practice is that no single choice is made. So uh, when you change in finite time the temperature, say uh, you uh, do some cooling ramp, then domains are formed. So locally different ground states are chosen and the boundary between domains is what is called a topological defect. Well. The typical questions that might come to mind are what determines the size of the domains, how many density, uh, you know, what, how many defects I get, how many topological defects I get, and you know, on what does it depend, or, or you know, what's the dependence with the uh, uh, cooling time, yeah, with the uh, time that you take to cross the transition. So these ideas were, uh, uh, you know, essentially uh, asked, and the the, I, the paradigm to, to answer these questions is the so-called kibel surek mechanism. So let, let me just introduce you briefly to, to this uh, gentleman. So Tom Kibel is, was an emeritus professor at Imperial College. Uh, you might know that he is co-discoverer uh, of the Higgs mechanism, so he was a candidate to the uh, Nobel Prize, and also one of the persons who, the first person who pointed out that symmetry breaking in the early stages of the universe uh, will play a role uh, in the structure formation and might lead to topological defects. So he passed away last, last year, um, unfortunately. And the second person, uh, you know, the Surek is Wojciech uh, Surek, you might know him well, uh, in, is uh, Argos Alamos. And he was the, the person who uh, suggested that these ideas that had been introduced in cosmology could be tested actually in the laboratory, and in particular in superfluid helium, so uh, leading to where the topological defects are just yes, vortices in the cloud. So let's look at the theory. It's extremely simple. It just yes, uses two uh, ingredients and that are common to any second order or continuous phase transitions. 
So it is, in particular, the universal divergence of both the correlation length and the relaxation time. So that means that if we look, you know, if our control parameter is the temperature, and we look at the distance to the critical value, and we normalize that, well, as a function of that distance, the correlation length diverges. So when you approach the critical point, then the correlation length blows up. And it does it as a power law, and the power law exponent, exponent is, is uh, the correlation length critical exponent, which you associate with a given universality class. Pretty much the same thing happens to the relaxation time, the time that it takes for the system to relax. And uh, it, uh, yes, the critical exponents are a bit different, so it's the same one that appears for the correlation length, and uh, said, which is the dynamic uh, correlation length, the dynamic uh, relaxation time critical exponent. So what does the kibel surek theory consider? It considers that the distance to the critical time, uh, to the critical point, varies in time in a given time scale tau q. So the idea is we are going to start in a high symmetry phase, a high temperature, and we lower the temperature, and at some point we reach the critical point. And then we keep lowering the temperature further down until we reach the broken symmetry phase where domains are formed. And to get an idea of how the theory works, you plot the equilibrium relaxation time, but now substituting this, uh, you assume kind of a adiabatic approximation, you, you substitute this dependence in the uh, denominator, in, yeah, in the denominator, and what you get is uh, this, this curve, yes? So what you see is that far away from the critical point, the relaxation time is very small, uh, whether you are in the high symmetry phase or in the broken symmetry phase, but close to the critical point, the relaxation time is huge. And then the system has to fall out of equilibrium. When you are driving the system uh, over here, it can respond very quickly. But as you approach the critical point, the relaxation time is so large that even if you wait a long time, the system is out of equilibrium. Yes? So this is the very kind of naive uh, simplification in the kibel surek mechanism, which is to split the dynamics across the transition in a sequence of stages which are either adiabatic or frozen, where nothing happens, essentially, or adiabatic again. And the key insight of the theory is to uh, uh, use uh, the, uh, the, this time scale, uh, which is the boundary between the frozen states and the adiabatic states, so this uh, freeze-out time is called, to estimate this time and then uh, use it to predict the size of the domains. So, the size of the domains, according to the kibel surek theory, is dictated by the equilibrium expression of the uh, correlation length evaluated at this value of, of time, which is the boundary between the frozen and the adiabatic stages. Well, it's a two-line calculation, and you can show that then the correlation length of the, of, the, of the size of the domains scales as a power law of the quench time, the time that you take to cross the transition, and uh, it's a power law exponent, you know, there's a power law with a power law exponent, which is nothing but a combination of the critical exponents of the phase transition. And this is the main prediction, yes, of, of the theory. Now, if you have the size of the domains, you can also compute the density, and the density is just, in one dimension, is just the inverse of the correlation length, and it scales with the quench rate, so the faster you go, the more, uh, uh, the more uh, topological defects you get. Uh, because the domains are smaller. Yeah? This is completely classical so far, but it, it has been studied as well in the quantum uh, case, and there was a uh, series of breakthroughs uh, in 2005, where, uh, thanks to works by Bogdan Damsky, Jacek Jarmaga, Anatoly Polkovnikov, Wojciech Surek, Uwe Dorner, and Peter Zoller, it was realized that the same, pretty much the same idea goes through in the, across a qu quantum phase transition, where the only thing that you have to do is to replace uh, the expression uh, for the equilibrium relaxation time uh, and use the inverse of the gap between the ground state and the first excited state for this relaxation time. The same power laws hold, so the density of excitations still scales with the same power law of the quench time. And you can even look at two other uh, observables, other quantities, such as the entanglement entropy, and they also have a scaling with this quench time. But we, we will just focus on density of excitations. Now, uh, to 
you know, this this can be tested, and perhaps the simplest possible problem uh, where you have a quantum phase transition uh, is the one-dimensional easing chain, where you have uh, ferromagnetic interactions and uh, a magnetic field. And what you do is to change the strength of the magnetic field. So if the magnetic field is very large, this term dominates, and uh, then the spins are kind of in a paramagnetic phase. If the interactions dominate, then you have two ground states, one with other spins pointing up or spins pointing down. So this is a perfect case to test the, the kibel surek mechanism in the quantum case. And what uh, you can do is to change the magnetic field in time, and you expect to create a states which have these kind of domains, you know, just pictorially represented here, where you have a spin downs, a spin up, and you know, so there will be a kink uh, here and a kink there. But this is, of course, a quantum system, and you have many, many excitations. Um, uh, so it, this, this model is also very nice because it's tractable, and this has been, uh, you can use the standard tricks such as the uh, jordan birner transformation and uh, Fourier, uh, Fourier transform to map the one-dimensional quantum easing chain to uh, the independent two-level systems, which essentially uh, have each of them and avoid the crossing. And you can compute the prob probability of excitation in each two-level system using landau center formula. So this was the, the, the way in which uh, people have been able to study, both in theory and in experiments, the density of excitations across a quantum phase transition. And let me just show here, uh, there were some experiments done uh, based on uh, quantum simulation with an ion trap of the easing chain, and they uh, study the density of uh, kinks versus the quench rate, and you have these nice power loads in full agreement with the uh, kibel surek mechanism. So this was just a long introduction to the kibel surek mechanism, and the conclusion so far is that it's very broadly applicable. It has been tested numerically and in experiments with uh, integrable, non-integrable models, uh, experiments are not quite conclusive. We wrote a few years back uh, two reviews, one with Tom Kibel and Wojciech Surek on uh, paying attention to inhomogeneous systems, and another one essentially systematically going through all experiments that uh, have been reported to, to the date. And the conclusion was that uh, the experiments are consistent with the Kibel Surek mechanism, yet there, there was no single experiment which was perhaps uh, proving uh, all aspects of the theory. Now, we, we want to push, in any case, the kibel surek mechanism to see whether it breaks. And it could well break uh, when describing strongly coupled systems, yes? So these are systems where the interactions are so strong that you cannot even use a quasi-particle picture because quasi-particles will also interact, yeah? So there is hard to have tools, in particular, uh, to describe the far from equilibrium dynamics. And one of the tools that has been proposed, and this is, uh, uh, you know, the part which is a, a bit more abstract, is the, that of holographic duality. Yeah. So uh, also known as ADS-CFT or gauge gravity duality. And the idea is that you are interested in describing a field theory, which is at a strong coupling, and is in a given dimension D. And pretty much in the spirit of integrable models, you are going to relate, you know, you, you relate this, you, you, you solve it, but by working on a dual problem, which is a, a gravity problem in one extra dimension. And so if, if it was the field theory was in dimension D, now the gravity theory is in the dimension D plus one, and it has a particular geometry, anti-visitor uh, geometry. So we wanted to, to test the kibel surek mechanism, so we are going to use this kind of game of, of mapping a field theory to a gravity theory, solve the gravity theory, and then learn uh, about the non-equilibrium dynamics of, of the field theory. And the theory we want to describe is that of a superconductor, which is on a ring. So the gravity theory, so this slide is, is kind of technical, uh, but you know, uh, it just shows the, the, the how to describe the gravity theory of the superconductor, dual to the superconductor, and it's a Einstein-Hilbert action where you have a gravity part and you have a Maxwell field, which is coupled to a scalar field. Now, in the so-called probe approximation, where Q is very large, the gravity part decouples and becomes a fixed background metric, and one simplifies the equations, uh, which just come from the action of the, the Maxwell part with the scalar field, 
And one finally kind of uh, simply end up solving the, these equations where you have the, covari the covariant derivative of the scalar field, uh, kind of Maxwell equations with a source and the current. Yeah? And now we, we still want to describe a phase transition of the superconductor. And pretty much as in, uh, in, the, in other superconductors, the phase transition is going to be created by the temperature. Uh, so temperature is going to be the control parameter. And that means if you want to have temperature in the field theory, it means that the gravity theory should have a black hole. So that's what the ADS-CFT correspondence tell us. And it is the, temper the Hawking temperature of the black hole that sets the temperature in the field theory. So ultimately, what we do is, you know, the way we are going to simulate the, 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 the phase transition, uh, the superconducting phase transition, is by studying a gravity theory where we have a black hole. And because we want to change the temperature, we will have to change the radius of the black hole. Uh, and, and this is what we do, essentially. Now, the metric that we choose is that of a uh, BTC bla black hole, Baniados uh, Telpenbon uh, Sanelli black hole, which uh, is well known. And uh, the other thing we have to do is to be able to uh, extract from the bulk field, which is in the gravity theory. So this time, uh, this x is the coordinate of this on the boundary, where the boundary leaves the superconductor. But said is 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 a coordinate which is in the bulk, but is absent in the in the conformal theory. And the way we we are able to extract the order parameter of the uh, superconductor is by making an expansion of the bulk field near the boundary. And the first term is the source, and the second term we can uh, relate with the uh, order parameter. So this is kind of uh, technical, but essentially maybe uh, we can just uh, go to a picture. So again, we want to describe the dynamics of, of a su uh, superconducting phase transition, which is at the boundary. So it's on a ring. The superconductor is on a ring. And you can think of this uh, ring in red color. Now, the way we describe the dynamics there is by looking at an extra dimension, which is the, inside the disk. And that's where the gravity theory uh, lives. Yeah? And because we need to change the temperature at the boundary at the, uh, in the superconductor, we need to change the radius of the black hole. So the experiment that we do, the numerical experiment, is to uh, essentially just uh, change the radius of the black hole and see how the uh, order parameter starts to grow as we cross the phase transition. And we can study the order parameter in, in detail. Um, in, so this is more or less what you see in the numerics uh, initially. There is no uh, condensed fraction, so there's no superconductor. And as you uh, decrease the temperature below the, super, the, the critical point, uh, then uh, the condensed fraction starts to grow, to ac accumulate. And because it's on a ring, there is a good chance that uh, you end up with a non-zero winding number. Yes, So the, 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 there is the phase of the superconductor doesn't need to be constant, and there is a chance to trap a configuration where there's a non-zero uh, winding number. Pretty much, so essentially, you get a, a, super con a super current, a spontaneous super current. Um, so we, one, there are two things that we can study uh, with respect to the kibel schreck mechanism. We can study the time scale on which uh, the condensate grows. Uh, so for instance, here I saw uh, three different snapshots of, of uh, of the, well, different plots of the evolution of the order parameter when the quench time through the phase transition is very short. You know, so then you see in green is the equilibrium value and in red the non-equilibrium value. And you see that they are really uh, uh, different and only at long times they agree. Now, if you go a bit more uh, slowly, so higher uh, quench time, then you see that they start to agree earlier. And if you go more slowly, they also match earlier. Yeah? Now, the time scale, this offset between the equilibrium and the non-equilibrium value is predicted by the kibel surek theory. And we can study uh, whether it matches the prediction. According to the kibel surek theory, it's, uh, this time scale is uh, proportional to the quench time. It's a power law of the quench time. And we can measure it from the, we can extract it from the numerics and just study it as a function of the quench time. And in logarithmic scale, you see that it 
beautifully reproduces a power law uh, with some deviations at very fast quenches, but other, other, other than that, as you expect, at long times, there's good agreement with the Kirill Surek theory. So this is one, one of the things uh, you can see. Yeah? The other, as I mentioned, is the winding number. And the winding number, again, is the phase of the superconductor uh, uh, you know, accumulated uh, across the uh, circumference. And the way to estimate it is uh, you have a, a ring of a given circumference, and that's C. And you consider that this, during the phase transition, there is a random walk uh, done by the phase of the superconductor, where the number of steps is precisely given by C over the number of domains. So, you know, it's the, it's the, the circumference over the number of, over the size of the domains gives you the number of, gives you the number of domains. And then you consider that the phase does a random walk uh, with the number of domains, and then the total phase uh, goes as in diffusion problems with the square root of the number of steps. You can then, uh, of course, the, the winding number on average vanishes because there's uh, equal chance of getting a supercurrent which is clockwise or counterclockwise. So the average is zero of, of, the, of the winding number, but you can look at the dispersion, and the dispersion does not vanish, and according to the kibel surek theory, it scales with the quaint time in a universal way. Yeah? So this is, again, something that we can test in, in the, in the uh, numerically. And uh, here is a plot of the dispersion of the winding number versus the quench time. And uh, one, again, sees that at very fast quenches, uh, the, there's kind of a saturation because, uh, uh, yeah, the, the system is finite, so you cannot support arbitrarily large winding numbers. But at the slow quenches, then there is a nice agreement with the kibel surek uh, power law prediction, which is of the form, you know, it's, it's just a power law on the quench time, on the quench time and we can see that the power row exponent uh, mesh, uh, extracted from the numerics is very close to, the, to that one predicted uh, by the theory, yes, by the kibel surek theory. So this was uh, a test of the kibel surek mechanism at the strong coupling using uh, the tools of ADS-CFT. And uh, the conclusion is essentially the kibel surek mechanism also applies to strongly coupled uh, systems at least the ones described by uh, holographic duality. And, you know, there were two works that were reported in 2015. The first one uh, was by us, where uh, is the one I just described. And the second one, they did it in a, instead of a superconductor, they chose a superfluid in two spatial dimensions. So that numerically, what they did was much more challenging. Uh, but uh, uh, they, they essentially arrived to the same conclusion. Of course, what can happen is that there is coarsening of defects. So you cross the phase transition, some defects are formed. Everything at that stage is kind of well described by kibel surek mechanism. But if you wait long enough, then these defects can merge, yeah? can start to merge. So that, then there is some coarsening dynamics. So this, in our setting, because we have essentially a ring, yeah? so once a winding number is trapped on the ring, it's very difficult that it decays. It's possible, but it's extremely difficult. That's how, even in the laboratory, superconducting currents have been sustained for periods of over a year. Yeah? Now, in other settings, there's a possibility of having coarsening in dynamics, which can lead to deviations of kibel surek mechanism. And I think that uh, Prokakis will mention more about this uh, later on. Now, uh, if you are interested in this kind of thing, let me just point out that we have also been looking at scrambling of information, which is a related problem. And one of the things we have done is actually how to simulate these uh, strongly coupled systems in the laboratory, uh, for instance, described by ADS-CFT. So this is a recent uh, work where we propose the digital quantum simulation of a uh, minimal quantum gravity model described by ADS-CFT. And we have also been looking at their connection with random, metri random me metrics theory, in particular uh, for the decay of, uh, of quantum correlations. But so th this was essentially the, the first part of the talk. Again, the main message is that the kibel surek mechanism uh, also applies to at the strong coupling uh, up to some cor corrections that can come from coarsening in dynamics, which is not universal in the same sense as the, as the kibel surek theory. Good. So now, so this part was kind of maybe a bit abstract. Uh, I want to move now to something extremely 
much more apply. It's essentially a set of experiments on ultracoal atoms uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, the group of Haibimbu in, in Shanghai. Uh, but let me give you the, the big picture. So there's the so-called uh, tragedy of finite time thermodynamics, yes? and I'm going to explain wh what I mean by that. But pictorially, you know, it, it's the, this issue that if you want a machine which runs a high power, you know, which is uh, essentially can, can, uh, the, the engines uh, have a high work output power, then typically this, uh, these machines have huge losses. They are not efficient, and you know, they, they are, if you want, not eco-friendly, yes? Of course, I'm not going to answer this at, at this scale. I'm just going to look at uh, uh, quantum thermodynamics. And uh, the, the field itself has been motivated uh, on one side by the development of technologies, which have been going to uh, the nanoscale, yeah? and as well by uh, fundamental questions such as information uh, loss paradox, uh, the cost of computation, Maxwell demons, and so on. So the, the you know, this, this, this both uh, technological and fundamental issues have motivated the development of quantum thermodynamics. And in the context of quantum heat engines, which is my focus, uh, there is a beautiful uh, mapping that has been established between a quantum heat engine and light harvesting either in nature or in artificial uh, systems, yes? So the mapping, I guess, it goes back to Marlon Scali and collaborators, Smoil Mukamel, and Konstantin Dorfman, Dimitri Boronin, and also has been uh, discussed by uh, Martin Plenius, Susanna Huelga, and, and so on. So uh, there, there are big machines such as those uh, that I found in Shanghai, but I'm not going to be talking about these machines. I'm going to be talking about a much smaller uh, auto cycle, which is of the following form. Yeah? So it's a quantum heat engine, which runs in four strokes, and it uses a confined uh, ultra cold gas, which is here at high temperature, and it can expand doing some work on the outside. This is when work is done during this expansion. Now, w once it has expanded, then it can be cooled down and brought to a lower temperature and uh, easily compressed uh, to return it to, a, to the initial value of the uh, trap frequency. And once it is compressed, you heat it up to close the cycle, and then it goes on and on and on. Yeah. So this is the well-familiar roto cycle. Yes, we want to describe it uh, for many particles and in the quantum domain. Uh, and the working substance I'm going to use is a, a quantum fluid of identical particles, which are in an isotropic uh, harmonic confinement, and that interact with each other through this pairwise interaction potential. Now. A strong coupling in this part of the talk comes from the fact that the type of interactions that I'm going to use are satisfy this property. So they are a homogeneous function of degree minus two. So if I multiply the coordinates by a constant, I get this constant out uh, with a power of minus two. And it turns out that uh, unitary Fermi gas, uh, uh, you know, if you take a spin one half Fermi gas and you tune the uh, with a first back resonance the short range interactions, when the scattering length surpasses any other length scale in the system, then you reach the unitary regime where there is an emergent conformal symmetry, which precisely is associated with this uh, property of the interactions. So from this point of view, I'm going to take this, this, this property as a, uh, as a property of, of a strong coupling, though there are other systems that satisfy this property, such as an ideal Fermi gas or a tonks girardot gas or the calogero sutherland model. Now, why is this important? It is important because then it simplifies the dynamics terribly. You know, so what happens is that if you have a confined cloud and what, whatever is the density profile, if you change the frequency of the trap, the only thing you are going to see is that the uh, shape of the density profile is preserved. It only changes the scale, so it can go, it, it can undergo expansions or compressions, but the, there is uh, the same uh, shape of correlation functions, local correlation functions is preserved. This comes with another huge benefit, which is I can do the exact finite time thermodynamics. How does this work? Well, so for the finite time thermodynamics to describe the heat engine, what I need to do is to look at the mean energy. And the mean energy along a non-equilibrium process, in the presence of a scaling variance, 
I can always relate it to the initial mean energy, to the initial squeezing, and to the initial particle fluctuations. Now, if I have a thermal cloud at equilibrium, the initial squeezing can be shown to be zero. So I essentially only have the, this term and uh, the term with the particle fluctuations. The coefficients, which are time dependent, are described by the so-called uh, scaling factor, B. B is the function which tells you essentially the size of the cloud, so how the cloud is changing uh, scale or size as it undergoes uh, expansion or compression. And the way to find it is by just solving this uh, trivial uh, ordinary differential equation, which is the Ermakov equation, uh, where that relates the frequency of the trap that you are changing. So you have your confined atomic cloud, and you are changing the frequency of the trap. And then that changes the scale of the, the size of the cloud. Yeah? So, it, so with these tools, we can then compute the uh, non-equilibrium mean energy and compare it actually to the adiabatic value. Yeah? So it, it, is, it has been shown that in quantum thermodynamics, uh, non-equilibrium quantum thermodynamics of heat engines, this ratio between the non-adiabatic energy and the adiabatic energy plays a key role. And it's, so, so the, the, it's called Q star, non-adiabatic factor. It essentially uh, represents quantum friction. So what's quantum friction in this context is just uh, the excess of energy with respect to the adiabatic trajectory. So this Q star is always larger or equal than one. And we can uh, find explicit expressions which depend only on the frequency of, uh, of the trap, on the modulation of the trap frequency and the scaling factor. This is only true in the presence of a scaling variance. Yes? So th this whole uh, treatment relies on, on this dynamical symmetry. Otherwise, uh, one just have to do, uh, one that doesn't have this neat understanding, one will have to do numerics more generally. But for scaling variant systems, we have this very nice property that we are able to identify the quantum friction in, in terms of this uh, simple equation. Now, for the sake of illustration, I'm going to present results for the so-called Calogero Sutherland model. So this is a system of one dimensional bosons, uh, which are in a, a harmonic trap and that interact with each other through an inverse square interaction potential. Yes? So this is a well-known model for those in, uh, you know, who are interested in integrability. It was introduced in the uh, early 70s, and it has lots of beautiful properties. One is that it allows you to track the physics of ideal bosons and hardcore bosons just by changing the value of the uh, coupling constant uh, lambda. Yeah? So we can get hardcore bosons in one limit, we can get ideal bosons in another limit. And as I saw you in the previous slide, we can also get the exact finite time thermodynamics with no approximations whatsoever. Uh, there are other beautiful properties. It's known to be an ideal gas of particles obeying fractional exclusion statistics, a concept introduced by Haldane, and, uh, shown in this context by Murthy and Sankar. And well, it, it, it does have other, other uh, cute properties but you know, one, one of the remarkable things, because this model is uh, integrable, uh, uh, is uh, actually super integrable, the only effect of the interactions goes into renormalizing the zero point energy. So the spectrum of this model, in some sense, is very pathological, because you have a zero point energy that depends on the interaction coupling, and then the excitations are exactly the same that you will have for an ideal Bosch gas or an ideal Fermi gas. So very, very simple spectrum in some sense. Thanks to that, we can compute the uh, uh, partition function on mean energy at equilibrium. And this is what we need to also compute the non-equilibrium part. Yeah? So the, the formulas uh, do not matter. Yes, we can compute it exactly with no approximations. And uh, with this, uh, all this information, essentially with equilibrium properties, we can account for non-equilibrium properties. And we can define the mean work done, for instance, in a expansion as the energy of the final non-equilibrium state minus the energy of the initial state. Yeah? So this is the way we define mean work in, in quantum thermodynamics. Now, once you have the mean work, you, you can look at the uh, total efficiency of your auto cycle when you run it completely. And the efficiency is, as in classical physics, is the total work done divided by the heat that, that is absorbed, by, by the heat uh, consumed by the engine. Yeah? And in our case, uh, in the presence of a scaling variance for any 
uh, system which uh, which has scaling variance, we can find this expression which is exact, where we have essentially this this part is the auto frequency, the the, the maximum possible uh, efficiency, and then we have this prefactor. Yeah? This prefactor is in principle quite complex, but there is a simple upper bound that we can find which is that the efficiency in finite time is all, always a smaller or equal than one minus the quantum friction coefficient during the expansion uh, times the ratio of the uh, frequency of the trap when the cloud is expanded and when it is compressed, yes? So we have this many particle uh, quantum motorcycle and we can find, uh, this is the first time that a bound to the efficiency is introduced in finite time uh, in, in quantum thermodynamics and this is the bound. This, the bound is the, the efficiency is one minus the quantum friction times the ratio of the frequencies. Yeah. Uh, so you can see that the larger the friction, the lower the efficiency. So Q star is larger or equal than one by definition. And if it's one, well, this is the best uh, case because then the efficiency is, uh, reaches the, the maximum value. But if it's, uh, the friction increases, then the, the efficiency decreases, yes? So we can look at the, and this is essentially the, the so-called priority of finite time thermodynamics, is the fact that if you want to increase the efficiency, uh, you have to suppress quantum friction. And quantum friction is typically suppressed by adiabatic protocols. Adiabatic protocols take a long time and then reduce the power of the engine. So you, the, 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 st the, the standard understanding of this problem is that if you want a very efficient machine, then the power is gonna be very low because uh, you have to operate the machine in a long time scale to reduce quantum friction, to reduce friction. And for over 30 years, maybe 30, 40 years since the, since the 70s, people have been optimally trading efficiency for power. Yeah? to see uh, how to operate a thermal machine, a quantum thermal machine, or, uh, uh, ideally. Now, what I want to introduce is the notion of shortcuts to adiabaticity because they completely avoid the need to trade off efficiency and power, yeah? So shortcuts to adiabaticity are non-adiabatic processes that reproduce adiabatic dynamics. So they, they go fast, they are non-adiabatic, but somehow excitations are canceled and the final state is at equilibrium, or it's as it will be had I driven the system slowly. So to give you an idea of, of the applications, shortcuts to adiabaticity have been applied to quantum thermodynamics, to transport of ions, or loading of an optical lattice. Uh, they have also been used to probe uh, quantum correlations and even to suppress uh, topological defects, either in classical or quantum uh, transitions. Yes? These are also only works uh, on which I have been involved, so it's a perfectly biased uh, uh, set of applications, but there are many others, and we have written uh, a review on, on this, which is quite exhaustive. Um, what we want to do now is to use shortcuts to adiabaticity to essentially avoid this triadic of finite time thermo thermodynamics, so we hope that by making use of shortcuts to adiabaticity, we can set in finite time, in a small time, quantum friction to zero and then reach the maximum efficiency and still have high power. Yeah? So this is, we, we want to avoid this trading of efficiency and power and just try to get the best possible result where I have both maximum efficiency and very high out, output power. So this is an idea that we introduced in, uh, with John Gould and Mauro Paternostro in 2014 and we extended uh, to many po uh, the many, many particle case uh, only recently in 2016. And uh, Jan Bingon, uh, who is a close friend, uh, actually reported after us uh, his first work, but actually managed to publish it uh, first, which is wonderful. So this was work with Peter Hange, where they also study how shortcuts to adiabaticity can be used uh, in a heat engine. In, a cla in their case, they emphasize classical heat engines to suppress friction. So this, this, this set of works have essentially uh, uh, provide this new approach to finite time thermodynamics based on shortcuts to adiabaticity. And the way to do it is, you know, in the cycle we have an expansion where friction is created, we have a compression where also friction is created. So the idea is to replace these expansion and compressions by shortcuts to, to expansions and compressions. Yes? So super adiabatic uh, strokes. 
So th this leads us to how to do a fast non-adiabatic expansion in which we suppress excitation. So how to implement these super adiabatic strokes, yes? So in principle, it seems that this is impossible or is precluded by the adiabatic theorem because it tells you that if you want to uh, suppress excitations, you have to go slowly, yes? So this idea that you can go fast, uh, create lots of excitations, and then suppress them, it seems a bit far-fetched in some sense. Now, in the case of a scale invariant uh, many-body systems, however, this can be easily achieved. So if we focus again on this uh, family of uh, quantum fluids, which are at the strong coupling, or at least have satisfied this property for the interactions, then I can change the frequency of the trap and still suppress excitations. And the way I do it is actually very simple. If you consider initially a given a change of frequency, lowercase omega of p, then it turns out that if you implement a different driving scheme, where, which is proportional to the one you intended, but you correct for the uh, rate of change of the frequency and even the acceleration of the frequency, then this protocol is a so-called counter diabatic protocol brings you to the equilibrium state at the final value of lowercase omega uh, with no essentially suppressing friction, yes? So these are the equations, but better displayed by uh, what was actually, this idea was tested in experimentally. You can compare, the, you, you look at the expansion of your cloud and you can compare a linear decompression of the trap in some time scale, here about 30 milliseconds with a shortcut to adiabaticity where the frequency of the trap changes in a less intuitive manner. Yeah? There is a fast expansion, then there is a bit of a compression, and then there is an expansion again. Well, it turns out that you know, in a given time scale, small enough, you can show that, of course, the linear ramp is going to be non-adiabatic. So if you look at the size of the cloud of the final state, then you see that it grows, but then there are huge excitations manifested in the breathing mode of the cloud that is excited uh, and there's no, in principle, in isolated systems, there will be no damping. Yeah. Now, what is beautiful is that shortcuts in the same time scale where you, with a linear ramp, you get large excitations, uh, they manage to suppress uh, quantum friction because the cloud grows, it reaches an equilibrium state and up to noise uh, in the experiment, then it remains constant. Yeah. So yes, by, you know, the, the time scale is the same. It's, so you, in principle, expect a strong non-adiabatic excitations. Uh, however, they are all suppressed, yes? So this builds on theory that was developed uh, in the last few years. First, we proposed it actually for, for a single particle, single time-dependent harmonic oscillator. And then I extend it to many, uh, many body quantum fluids. And uh, experiments have, been, uh, have demonstrated this uh, by now, uh, both for single particle, uh, mean field BCs, and even uh, the group of your uh, Smith Meyer did an experiment with a one dimensional Bosch gas, which is you have important phase fluctuations beyond uh, mean field. Yes. So we want to do this at a strong coupling. And for those of you who are experimentalists, well, you know that this works very differently in the laboratory. So these are pictures from the group of Hai Bin Bu uh, at the uh, East China Normal University where uh, you can see with naked eye the unitary Fermi gas, uh, which is a uh, here trap. And well, you, know, you have the camera and the semen is lower and uh, essentially the, the whole uh, setup. Uh, so what we did is to essentially uh, do, do a shortcut to adiabaticity for the unitary Fermi gas. And actually, because uh, they do have control of the scattering length, we could actually compare the non-interacting case and the unitary case, yes? So there are four curves in this plot. Again, this is the size of the cloud, the scaling factor, versus the time of evolution. And we compare shortcuts, we can do shortcuts for both uh, the uh, non-interacting and the unitary Fermi gas. Uh, and in the same time scale, if you don't do a shortcut, if you just use a linear ramp, then you see that we excite uh, the breathing mode. And the breathing mode, is different for the non-interacting uh, case than for the unitary Fermi gas. But you know, the, for the equilibrium, uh, so the, the shortcut to adiabaticity shows that suppressions can be, uh, that the excitations can be suppressed in both systems uh, by the same protocol, actually. Uh, so this is the, uh, we, we have essentially a, a, a nice work in progress. We hope to submit it uh, during the uh, coming weeks. 
but essentially we have been able to study the finite time quantum thermodynamics of a unitary Fermi gas and implement super adiabatic strokes where we saw that there is no friction. Yeah? So we have developed the theory of quantum friction for the uh, unitary Fermi gas and then uh, build shortcuts to, to, to set it to, to zero, I mean, to, to, to the lowest possible value, to no friction, and implement them in the, in the laboratory. Now, in the context, you know, coming back to the, to the, to the engine, well, so this is what we do. We, we now use these processes in the expansion and the compression. And thanks to that, we can solve that the efficiency in finite time equals the maximum value, which is the auto efficiency. Yes. Why? Because we have set the quantum friction equal to zero, uh, so the Q star equal to one, and we recover the, the maximum uh, value of the efficiency for this cycle, which is the, the, auto, uh, the auto efficiency. And again, you can see that the process is highly non-adiabatic. So we pump excitations along the process. So if we look at the excess of work uh, along the process with respect to the adiabatic value, it increases a lot. But then uh, upon completion of the protocol, it matches identically the, uh, the equilibrium value, yes. So this is, the, in a way, the success of the shortcuts to adiabaticity in finite time thermodynamics. because. Essentially, they allow you to prevent this trading of, of uh, power for efficiency. So you can be both maximally efficient and have a high output power. So you know this is what uh, Ronnie Koslov like to call eco-friendly Lamborghini. So you, you have quantum uh, thermal machines which are operate at maximum efficiency uh, with no friction. I'm sorry to interrupt so, you, but are you are you are you approaching to an end because? Okay. Uh, I am I am closing. So okay. this was the summary. So this was the the I just want to uh, refresh. So this was the uh, we have seen the universality of the kibel shurek mechanism and that it works in a strongly coupled quantum systems. And in the second part of the talk, which was very different, I presented how shortcuts to adiabaticity can be used for uh, quantum heat engines. Yes. So uh, yeah. So I just want to thank quickly my collaborators uh, and uh, yeah, thank you all for your for your attention. Okay.